All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, before I start here, is this anybody's, the, this wallet? All right, now that I got your attention, <laughs> hi, everybody. <laughs> Sorry, a little, little underhanded. I learned that one through Southwest Airlines. So you know how you know, you're doing your, your FAA mandatory pre-flight you know, flight attendant uh, check. And that's how they got everyone's attention. I was like, that's a good one. I hate you, but that's a good one. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's get started here. So first off, uh, thank you very much for coming to our, to our presentation today. Um, I realize that there are a gajillion different uh, sessions that you have the opportunity of attending, and you picked this one. So um, I, I mean it when I say thank you. Uh, very much appreciated. I hope that you get something out of this. Um, we're going to be talking about um, stuff that I hope is relevant to you, namely uh, how to migrate and protect VMs uh, going into EC2 from on-premise. Um, so we are Zerto. Uh, my name is Alex Schenk. And <clears throat> my role here at Zerto is to serve in an advisory capacity uh, for, from our solutions architect um, uh, organization. So basically my job is not to own accounts, it's not to have a territory. Um, of course, just like anybody else who is an employee for a company, I've got a vested interest in seeing our organization succeed. Uh, but the way that I do that is through talking to our customers, having architectural, you know, high level architectural conversations and solving problems. So. By all means, um, I invite you to come up, uh, talk to me after the, the conference. Let's talk to you about uh, how we could be a potential help to you, how we can be um, consultative. And um, you know, by all means, even if you uh, decide that you, know, you just want to say hi, I, I welcome that as well. So uh, with me is my, my good colleague here, Mike Masters. Um, so Mike has been gracious enough uh, to join us from Maritz. He is one of our, um, one of our evangelists, if, if I may use that word. Um, he, he works for uh, a customer of ours, and you know, we're very, very happy to have you here. And you know, I just want to say thank you. Well, so thank you. Thank, thanks for coming. OK, so let's, uh, let's get started here. Uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to talk a little bit about what Zerto is. We're going to talk a little bit about what Maritz does with us. We'll talk about the use cases for what, uh, how, how Zerto can fit into your uh, cloud environment going into AWS, uh, how we extend your cloud uh, through the use of our IT resilience platform. So we're also going to talk about how we do this. Uh, the architectural pieces that are in place in order to make this work. And we're also going to be topping this off with a demo. So I have here a live environment, which I just spun up today. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that, you know, before I was in the writing room, that everything is working. Hopefully we don't have the curse of the live demo here. If not, or if we do, whoops. <laughs> but, uh, but hopefully we'll, we'll all get something out of this today. And, um, you know, let's, let's just jump right into it. So um, a little bit about myself here. So I am, again, like I said, a solutions architect. I serve in an advisory capacity at Zerno. Um, my job is more than just AWS, but I mean, I am, I am considered the AWS subject matter expert at, at Zerno. Um, I am active on Twitter as well as through various other, you know, what we'll call meat space communities. So uh, come see me at uh, AWS community events. Come see me at VMUGS. Um, definitely want to make sure that I'm engaged with our with our customers at at a very you know direct level here. Um, so follow me on Twitter at vpilotshank. And um, Mike, please, if you can give yourself a quick intro. Sure. Hey, my name is Mike Masters. I work for Merits. We're a, uh, we have multiple business units. We, we do travel, we have uh, events planning, and we just, we have a lot of big customers. VMware is one of our, is a customer of ours for different things like that. A lot of our uh, automotive businesses, uh, if you buy a car, you get a, a thing in the mail with a link to do a, a survey, probably nine times out of 10, it's gonna come from our company on the back end. So. We, we have a lot of big companies, and, and I'm also a VMUG leader in St. Louis. So if you guys are uh, VMware customers or anything, make sure you come to the VMUGs. 
Well, Even if you're not a VMware customer, if yes. you're an AWS you customer, come on, come on over and, and spread the good word, right? Yes, yes. So uh, as we go on, we'll go over some uh, cases where we've used Zerto and, and things that we've been doing over the years with Zerto and AWS. Cool. All right, so let's, um, let's talk a little bit about what we do here as an organization and what our, what our product does. So Zerto is a disaster recovery and application mobility platform. We term this as IT resilience. So what we are doing is we are giving you the power of extending your existing data center going into AWS. Uh, it, we allow you to move data from vSphere into AWS without the use of an agent that you have to install on every single one of your VMs. We give you the ability to uh, journal your data over a period of time as well. So if you want to roll back or do a failover um, to say a very specific point in time, say you know with, with a granularity of around five seconds or so, we're providing that. We give you the ability to basically give, your, give yourself and your business a DVR for your data. So if you need to rewind for any reason, if you have, say, a disaster that hits your data center and now you need to roll up into, say, your VPC, say that you need to get out of the data center altogether, or you need to have some sort of hybrid type of, uh, of use case here, we provide that. We give you the ability to move workloads from any location uh, to any other location in, in AWS based upon your business needs proactively or reactively. We've been doing the AWS game for you know, several years now. 2015 is when we supported uh, EC2 and S3. And um, we are continuously improving the product, uh, giving better uh, RPO and RTO uh, SLAs through our product. And um, we are also introducing a couple of uh, interesting new features that we'll be dropping in the next version, which is uh, coming out uh, in um, Q1 of 2020. So um, for, for that, that's, that's what we do in a nutshell. Um, basically, you got a VM on premise, you want to move it into the cloud, either for disaster recovery or mobility uh, reasons. We're, we're the guys for you. We're, we're here to, to enable you to do that. All right. Oh, I'm a little premature on my stuff. This is a, a little snippet about Merits and, and who we are. Right now, we, we do, uh, we have, I don't remember how many instances we have in AWS running production environment right now, plus on site. So we're, we're hybrid right now. Uh, use Zerto to protect our production instances that we run in, internally. Some companies have, have different RTOs. Some companies, you know, so we're all over the board when it comes to, to the RTO, RPO game. So Zerto helps us achieve that, you know, depending on, on what the customer wants and needs. Um, we're gonna be expanding with Zerto this next year, moving more production stuff into it for pr protection. Uh, we, as it says here, we, we do a lot of Fortune 100 companies. It may not have our name on it, but we host a lot of stuff for companies internally. Cool. So to expand a little bit upon uh, what Zerto can actually provide for you, um, the, the first one that immediately comes to mind when I'm thinking using Zerto going into AWS is for the bulk onboarding of brownfield uh, VMs. If you have a strategic initiative to get into the cloud, if you are using AWS as your strategic cloud of choice and you need to start converting brownfield VMs into um, EC2 instances, well, there, there are a variety of ways that you can do that. but uh, we like to think that Zerto is particularly efficient at doing this. We have built some um, some hooks in going into EC2 that allow for a very efficient bulk migration, and it it allows for um, cost effectiveness as well because what we're doing is we're storing that information in <clears throat> S3 as opposed to an EBS volume, which is about ten times more expensive. So when it comes time to do a migration all of your data is already there. We'll talk about that in the upcoming architecture uh, demonstration here, um, but just know that 
the reason why you may want to look at us isn't just for onesie twosie type of migrations, but rather for a large scale migration. If you have um, say tens or hundreds of VMs that you want to move all at once, well then we should be having a discussion. The other thing that we do is disaster recovery. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we have a journal. This journal allows for the very granular segmentation of your data over time. So in other words, say that you've got a VM that's generating IO. So a database is a good example of this. That database is constantly changing. Over time, the contents of that disk uh, that that database is writing to is going to look a little bit different you know, from point in time to point in time. And it's going to be, if it's a, if it's a production database, it's going to be very IO intensive. Well, what we do is we are tracking those changes using our virtual replication appliance technology. What that allows us to do is basically give you a transaction log of your disk. So we, we handle all the hard bits over this. Just know that what we are really doing is we're storing that information in a format which allows you to rewind to a very specific point in time. The granularity that you can expect is around maybe five to 20 seconds, depending upon burst and IO and what your network can handle in terms of, um, in terms of bandwidth. But generally speaking, 10 second increments, that's what we provide you. Finally, we have other um, capabilities as well. We can actually move information from point A to point B in a proactive manner. Uh, this is particularly interesting from some more creative use cases. So, you know, if you need to have more than just, say, a disaster recovery or an application mobility use case, we have the ability to do things like cloning. We have the ability to do things like file level recovery. So you can extract a single piece of data out of your journal without ever having to actually do a failover. So your mean time to value is reduced uh, you know, significantly by that. Uh, it, it, like I said, we are constantly changing this product over time. AWS is, is a you know, relatively uh, nascent uh, technology for us. Um, I, but you know, as, as we all know, there are so many hooks going into both EC2 and S3 that um, you know, the, the, the roadmap of our product looks very, very robust. So let's, um, let's get into the technical bits here. So now that we've set the stage about you know, what, why you'd want to be here, why you'd want to be talking to us right now. So the way that we move data <clears throat> from on-premise is through the use of two specialized VMs. We have something called a Zerto Virtual Manager, or ZVM, and we also have something called a VRA, a Virtual Replication Appliance. So the ZVM is intended for the front end work of our product. So in other words, you as an administrator will end up writing AP, um, you know, calls that will, will talk to our API. That API is going to talk to that Zerto Virtual Manager. You may log into the Zerto Virtual Manager using our web GUI. Um, other Configuration tasks, such as setting up what we call a virtual protection group, is done using the Zerto Virtual Manager. So really, the ZVM is the brains of our product. It's what allows us to actually do the setup, configuration, and management of a Zertofied environment. The second piece here is that VRA, that Virtual Replication Appliance. The Virtual Replication Appliance is, for all intents and purposes, a proxy. That proxy allows for us to do um, to, to do the actual data movement. So if you have a chunk of data that's getting written from a VM to your storage array, what that VRA is doing, it's acting as a filter. We detect those I.O. changes and we detect them at a block level. So what we do is we make a copy of every single I.O. that is being sent from your VM into the SCSI bus on an ESXi or Hyper-V host, and then we're sending it across the wire to the ZCA, the Zerto Cloud Appliance. The Zerto Cloud Appliance, which is running as an instance within a VPC, all that is doing is it's acting as a front end, so it has a Zerto Virtual Manager service, and a back end, a Virtual Replication Appliance service. So we combine the two of them together into a compact instance, and that's basically the endpoint that, that you're gonna use. So what happens when we are doing replication? Oh, Go back there. What happens when we are doing replication 
is we are sending those I.O. changes into an S3 bucket. So when you install Zerto into, a, into an EC2 instance, what we do is we auto-create an S3 bucket which will contain our checkpoints. So if you ever crack open that S3 bucket, you'll see a whole bunch of very granular checkpoints with a pretty cryptic string uh, as the object name. That's our journal. That is how we can do that very granular recovery is because we take those objects, we reassemble them, and that's how we get our new EBS volume, which we then attach to a new EC2 instance upon failover or migration. From AWS is a little bit different. We have worker instances. We have something called a Zerto Amazon Snapshot Adapter. So we are taking an EBS snapshot. And then we do a snap differential read. And that is done through a process that is called the ZSAT or the Zerto Satellite. Um, you're not going to be seeing this unless you're doing replication out of AWS. Usually we're, we're talking about going into a VPC, not out. But just know that what we're doing is we're providing you the ability to move around. So this over here is the way that we do that, is through those two helper instances. Outside of that, it's very much a similar process. We're taking data that we are reading off of a, off of a disk as it's being generated, and we're sending it across a wire, storing it in a journal. Now, how do we do this? And you know, this is teeing us up for the, for the demo here. Um, the way that we do translation from S3 storage into EBS, so you know, just, just to clarify here, S3 storage, can, can we run compute instances out of S3? No, no, yeah, S3 is object storage. You can't run a block store out of S3 without doing some pretty complicated black magic. So the fastest way that we are going to be able to do this conversion is not through the Amazon API, which clocks out at around 10 to 15 megabytes per second, megabits per, yeah, megabits um, per second. What we do instead is we create an, a helper instance. So we create what is called a Z importer. Now the Z importer is a helper instance, it's ephemeral in nature. So we create this instance uh, on demand we will use it as a surrogate for our new EBS volumes, and then we spin it down and get rid of it. So the effective transfer rate is around 200 megabytes per second when we use this instance. So it's much, much faster than just doing an AWS import um, API call. So the advantage of this, of this um, Z importer instance, and this is really where, you know, where Zerto comes into play here, because this is our infrastructure piece, this gives us the ability to take data, which is stored in a object store, reassemble that data, and we use that Z importer as, again, as a surrogate. In the background, we've already created your brand new EC2 instance that you wanna do a failover of. We take the EBS volume that's been recreated using the Z importer, we then transfer that EBS volume into the brand new failed over instance, and then we get rid of the Z importer. Okay. Voila, you have yourself a brand new EC2 instance that you just did a failover of. Again, we'll, we'll show that in just a moment. This just gets a little bit more into the generics of Zerto here, just to, you know, just to kind of reinforce why we're talking about a journal here. So it's very easy for us to talk about uh, you know, doing a migration from, say, uh, VMware into EC2. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, there are plenty of additional tools that can do this, and you know, pl plenty of, uh, of organizations try. Really, what we are here to do is not just provide a migration service, but also continuous DR, continuous data protection. So this journal over here, is maintaining right order fidelity across an entire virtual protection group. The advantage of this is that instead of having to do a, say a VSS stun of your VM every time that you want to take a, a point in time copy of your VM, uh, what we're doing is we're grouping together VMs into application groups, into what is called a virtual protection group, a VPG. So, this allows you to do a failover to a very specific point in time of a multi-VM application group 
and every single VM will think that it's failed over to the exact same moment in time, complete with the state of the disk at that moment in time. So you're never going to have, say, a database server, which is out of sync with your index server, which may be out of sync with your web application. So that, that's really the, the power of the, of the VPG when, we are, um, when we're doing a failover from a DR perspective. OK. So to reiterate here, the recovery steps. Number one, the VRA captures the data en route going to your storage array. Number two, the VRA sends that data into the ZCA, which is located in your VPC. <laughs> so single instance. Number three, the ZCA sends that data down to S3, and it's journaled. And when we want to do a failover, that's when we spin up brand new uh, helper instances, and that's when the failover occurs. And then we get rid of those helper instances as soon as they're done, taking advantage of uh, the elasticity of EC2. I'm going to take a, a moment here, ask if anyone has any questions here. You have a small enough uh, um, room here that I want to make sure that if you have any questions along the way, that we can answer them. You, you want to uh, put, put your uh, question into the microphone there? Does it support failback? Yes, it does. So we can move data from a VPC back into a uh, supported um, environment. So that could be vSphere. That could be uh, another location of some sort. So, so yes, failback is absolutely supported. And normally the replication, oh. sorry. Yeah, no, please go ahead. So the replication happens over the internet, or is it a VPN connection required? Yeah. So. The way, that, the way that replication works with us is that as long as you have some sort of connection into a VPC, that's all that matters. So it could be a VPN, it could be direct connect. Um, we, we don't, so we don't support unencrypted, you know, uns, unsupported links, right? So in other words, you have to have some sort of end-to-end uh, of -end con connectivity. But as soon as that's established, then replication either to or from is possible. And we store the state of your VPG after a failover. So once you reestablish connectivity, we can do what is called reverse protection and start to build back that journal in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Now, on the initial slide, you mentioned there's the vCenter and the vzvm. And you said you mentioned the word appliance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me repeat the question just for. Yeah. The reason yeah. I'm, I'm going to retrospect that back. Yep. We're talking about a lot of redundancy here, and we're talking about a single point of failure with putting in a pizza box in your location. That's what caught my attention, so I have some other questions too. Go ahead. Sure. No, so, so the question, just to repeat here, is um, I, I was mentioning the word appliance, and what does that actually mean? Uh, do we have a piece of hardware that we ship on site? And you know, does that represent a physical point of failure? And their answer is no, it's a virtual appliance. So when we say appliance, what we're really talking about is a piece of software. So as long as you have, say, you know, a, a host, you know, an, an ESXi host that you can store the VRA on top of, there is no appliance that we ship in. It's not like you can get zero branded hardware and stick it into a data center. So from a redundancy perspective, we support a replication topology called one-to-many, and that one-to-many allows you to do fan-out replication to as many targets as you wish. In the interim, even if you only have point-to-point -point replication, all of the metadata that you need in order, to, um, in order to support a virtual protection group, that is stored not only on your source side, but also on your DR side as well in, a, in our database. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> oh sure. Yeah. So I mean, if you think about it, if you have a failure of that particular host, 
sounds like a disaster to me. So we're going to have the ability to do a, a recovery on the, on the replication side. Now, what we also will do is just because you have a temporary failure, so say that this isn't like a, a smoking hole scenario, right? If you have a temporary failure, we can do what is called a delta sync, and that delta sync will rebuild the, uh, the required bits in order to continue replication. At that point, we're back to five to 10 second RPO land. So everything is transferring over asynchronously? Asynchronously, this is not sync replication. So I wanna be very clear about that. We're not delaying your, your writes at the storage layer. We are operating at the hypervisor instead, at the hypervisor layer. So there's always gonna be around a five to 10 second delay. I mean, we're not going to give you zero RPO, zero RTO, but what we will give you is a nearly synchronous replication stream at all times. So you're saying that you get, you'll lose five seconds of data going across because of? That, that, that is correct, on average, okay. on average. Okay. Cool. Uh, can, 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 uh, so uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can, can everyone hear, by the way? Yes. Okay, good, right. good. I got a pretty loud voice. <laughs> <laughs> we should be friends. <laughs> Um, so we will transfer data in whatever format that it is written in. So we are, so first off, I want to be very clear about something. We are not a security product. So we're, we're not providing end-to-end um, -end encryption. Uh, what, what we're providing instead is basically a data mover. We're, we're a data mover with, with a lot of orchestration behind it. But ultimately, we get bits from point A to point B. Whatever the, the state of those bits are in, that's how they're gonna be transferred. So if you're managing the keys and you want to say, enable bucket replication in S3, or I'm, I'm sorry, bucket encryption in S3, not a problem. But ultimately, you're the keeper of the kingdom, not us. And I think that's the way that we like it. Right. Thanks for the questions. That's correct. Yep. But we're going to need, you, you do have something up at Amazon to be part of the endpoint, right? That is accurate. So that's still going to be an EC2? Yes. So, so are going to be paying for that? Is that one virtual machine, two virtual machines? So the SE's favorite answer here is it depends. Uh, <laughs> but with that being said, um, you will have anywhere from one to several ZCAs, depending upon your, your, your size. Now, I will say that we also recognize that you know, this, is, this is the cloud. We, we don't wanna have um, EC2 instances just running uh, willy-nilly without any, you know, any real reason to. Um, so we do have what is called a planner utility. Uh, you know, so in other words, we, we are able to estimate how many instances that you're going to need. And furthermore, we are working on the back end of in introducing what I'll call helper instances during normal continuous replication so that you don't have to have, say, four or five or seven or however many ZCAs in a very large environment. Um, ideally, we wanna get that down to maybe one, two ZCAs, um, and then only have, say, those helper instances when absolutely necessary. We're not there yet, we're working on it actively, um, but understood that you know, yes, there will be a fixed cost of doing infrastructure. Uh, you, you had a second question, right? Yeah, and I, I think I may have lost it. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. Uh, it, it, it's been a long conference already. <laughs> It, it is, so, so the Z importer, uh, so the question is it, the Z importer, when we do a failover, does that represent a cost? And you know, the answer is of course. So it, it is an EC2 instance that gets spun up. However, it only lives momentarily. So 
when we're talking about the Z importer, when we're talking about the, um, the ZASA or the ZSATs when we're doing failback, they're actually exactly what Amazon, what AWS had in mind when they were talking about cloud scale, when they're talking about elasticity. They spin up when necessary. And I mean, they, they may have a, you know, a chunk of, chunk of uh, resources at them. So you, know, you look at the sticker and you may be, well, wait a minute, these, these cost more than you know, the VMs I'm trying to protect, you know, what gives there? But the thing you have to remember is that they spin down as soon as that failover process is done. So they may only exist for 10, 20 minutes or so, maybe an hour if it's a really large machine, um, but it, it's temporary. Mm -hmm. Okay, go, go, go ahead. And, and then, then uh, so we'll, yeah. we'll answer here and then we'll, we'll uh, have our discussion with, uh, with Mike here. So, so please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. Yep. That, so, so we support. So there, there are. We we have a concept that we like to call the Elastic Journal, and the Elastic Journal is the ability for us to have what I'm going to call a short-term journal and a long-term retention. So that short-term journal is up to 30 days of very granular individual checkpoints. So I now granted. You know, just like anything, the more that you utilize, the more that you consume, the more that your AWS bill is going to be from, a, from an S3 perspective. Um, so we can help you with sizing that. Uh, generally speaking, I like to say around 7.5 to 10% of whatever it is that you're protecting is what the journal is going to be. Um, so if you want to have, say, a 72-hour journal, because that's a long weekend, then that's going to be an additional 30% of whatever it is that you're protecting. Um, but, but yes, exactly, that is, that is the power of having that journal, is we can rewind to right before the point in time where your, uh, you know, your poor administrator there ended up hitting that ransomware. All right, one, one more question. Ooh, so, so good clarification point. So the manager is actually in two separate locations. The ZCA, the ZCA, is a manager as well. Okay. It, however, it houses the bits for the virtual replication appliance in the cloud. The reason why we did that in EC2, by the way, is because we don't want to have multiple VMs, or excuse me, uh, EC2 instances running just you know, for, for infrastructure reasons. But, but, but good clarification. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, Just remember the question. Sure, sure. Sure. And, and then I'll answer, and then I, I swear we'll get to you. <laughs> yeah. How does it work with the flood cross availability? Cross availability zones. So that's something that we're working on right now. So right now we can get you into a region, we can get you out of a region, but you pick the availability zone that the ZCA wants to reside in, and that's you know based upon um, the the parameters that are available to the ZCA, you know, so you know, not just not just AZ, but uh, subnets, um, mm -hmm. the VPC itself, and um, and security groups. Those are what we configure, right, and that's what we manage. Yep. Uh, I have a two-part question. Sure. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good question. And 
I would say that we could address that. I, I mean, I'm not going to say that we're going to be the answer for every single customer everywhere. But what I will say is that, yes, we do have regulated customers. We have some particularly interesting three-letter organizations that are, that, are, that are customers. Do you think self-drivers were interesting? Yes. So, <laughs> oh, man, uh, what, what a, what a follow-up. All right, so, so we'll be talking about that uh, during, during the demo here. But, um, but let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you hanging just for, just for a couple minutes here. All right, so, Mike. Yes, sir. You are, you are a, a, a customer of ours, and you've been very happy with the product, right? Yes. So I, I paid him for it, just to say that, by the way. <laughs> um, so what, what I want to what I want to hear from you, and what, what I'd like for you to discuss is, um, what was what was the impetus for installing Zerto in your environment, and what has been your your overall impression so far, and um, you know, to, and you know, just just be just be honest here. I mean, we're we're yeah. a bunch of techies here, so. I think that goes a long way. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we were one of the early importers of Zerto. We've been using it for a few years now. And it was to do DR into AWS. We had business units in my group that were wanting to run, to do DR in AWS, pretty much. I mean, they, they we have a physical DR site, but we're solely migrating stuff to the cloud and getting people are still going to the cloud. And ultimately, we're ultimately gonna do DR fully in the cloud probably in the next couple of years. I think our physical DR site is probably gonna go away and we're just gonna do everything in the cloud at that point. Um, plus the RTO at our DR site, still using tapes. We don't have any, we don't have the bandwidth to our DR site to do replication. Uh, I don't remember what the bandwidth is off the top of our head, but it's not, it's not much. But um, so some of these questions you were asking about, about the, the drivers and, and things like that in VMware, we use, we use it for VMware too. So what you were saying with getting to the management site in the cloud, yes, we test that during our DR. We, I connect to the, to the Zerto cloud appliance and it will allow me to do failovers from the cloud. So if my production site went completely down, I could just connect into there do failover from there. <clears throat> and we test all that. We have, a, we have a DR network, so we build a VPC that is tied into our DR network. So whenever we do a DR simulation, which we just had one about a month ago, we bring up all of our DR instances on our DR network, and then we connect to our DR network and then test out everything on our DR network at that point. We, uh, over the years, we've gone away from, has anybody ever done AWS import for a VM? by hand, right, through the CLI. How long does that take? Fine. Yeah. So, so when, when Zerto first came out, a lot of their stuff was AWS import. Okay, now over the years, they've been bringing out the Z importer. So that first iteration of that, Alex can test, was the, the AWS import for the OS and the Z import for data, right? And a lot of that would do, had to do with the drivers not being installed. Uh, various mount points. What we've been running into with our Linux environment are the the disks, the mount points inside the disk aren't set up right to do the AWS import. You know, you know what I'm talking about. So you've got to work with the, your Linux team or if you're the Linux admin, you've got to get the, the, the disk just right so AWS import will work fine. We've been slowly converting all our stuff over to Z importer and, and the times have just been 40 to 50% faster. I mean, it's been, it's been a night and day difference. Servers that were taking three to four hours, maybe five hours, depending on, on the speed, I've cut it down to like 50 minutes now. <laughs> so. So, so the thing that I wanna, I wanna impress upon here is because we, we talked about this um, you know, a, few, a few weeks ago and um, what, what impresses me about this story is that what Z Importer can do and what ultimately Zerto as a bulk um, protection utility can do for you is it reduces your time to value. It, it means that you get your 
your VMs running in EC2 faster. And it does it with a lot less work than having to manually go in and using the AWS import method. Yes. So this ultimately means two things. One, your boss is happy because it means that this is going to be, this is going to be, uh, be providing value in a very short period of time, relatively speaking. And two, it means that your day just got freed up yes. and you can do way more interesting yes. stuff than. We were just talking about that. This last DR I did a month ago, last couple years, would be multiple days for me to finally get through all of our protection groups. Um, one of the one of the, the leverages or problems we're having now, and if you've done AWS import, you're limited by how many AWS imports you can do at one time. I think it's 25 now at one time. Yep. So so we yep. we have close. We're going on close to 100 protection groups right now. So. I can't kick off more than 25, because I, I still do AWS import for the OS, because I can't get my Linux team to get all the drivers installed properly. So I can only really kick off 25 at a time, or AWS will scream at me. So I have to go through it, and what would take a day to go finally get through all the VPGs, this last DR a month ago, you know, we started at 8 a.m., they declared a DR disaster. I restored all of our VPGs to 8 a.m., and by three o'clock in the afternoon, I'm done. I went home and they were like, what do you mean you're done? So, <laughs> so now it, it's just, now I have all these people coming to me now going, I wanna get my stuff in there and I wanna put our stuff in there because I don't wanna be here all week doing restores. Uh, so it's, it's just been, it's been great. And like it says there, best DR we've ever had was this past one as far as the Zerto DR. Um, so a new thing that we did this year, everybody, everybody familiar with Hadoop, right? The Hadoop cluster, big data. So this past DR, big data team came to me and said, we want to do DR in the cloud. We need to be able to do DR for our Hadoop cluster. A requirement from our business unit. Can Zerto do that? I was like, sure. So I restored in AWS five plus terabyte Hadoop cluster with 12 VMs, I think, total for the whole Hadoop stack and everything. Um, three and a half hours, five terabytes was restored, just to give you an idea of time. And they just thought that was amazing. They could not believe I could restore that much data that fast. <laughs> so it gives you an idea of time. So you, I'm just talking, waiting for him to get ready. Are you ready for your? No, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. Okay. But so none of, none of this was was possible without the introduction of the Xeon Porter. So when we, when we first introduced the, the Xeon Porter to our product, um, it, it was, a, it, it was a, a seismic shock for us because it meant that we could go from being basically, you know, hogtied right. from, you know, from, a, from an API perspective to supercharging that, that import process. So what is a very clunky and, and labor intensive um, process initially, granted it would inject the, the, the um, EC2 drivers automatically if we're using the AWS import method. So you know, we had to come up with a way around that. Um, but outside of that, I mean, the, the time to value is, is drastically, drastically reduced. Or, I mean, so that's ultimately what, what is the most important part Correct. Mike, thank you. I, I appreciate the uh, the time where uh, you know you're, you're speaking with us here. And um, by all means, please come up and, and talk to Mike more about his about his impressions. Um, let, let's let's uh, tie this off by talking about the actual product itself. So I have here a live environment where I'm running in my VPC over here. Um, a couple of different EC2 instances. I also have a connection to an on-premise vSphere environment uh, that is running you know, several VMs. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna, I'm, while I'm talking to you, I'm gonna kick off a failover. So this, this uh, virtual protection group over here has a Linux VM, which I created and I, I deployed today uh, when I woke up and I am, ready to do an actual failover.
So I'm going to click on this test failover button. And I'm going to click next. And then I'm going to pick my point in time where I want to do the failover to. So as you can see here, I have a list of very granular checkpoints here uh, where I've started replicating. So I'm just going to pick the latest one. And as you can see, if I do refresh, it's going to continue to update over time. So we're, we're continuing to do this, this updating even as we're doing the failover. And what, what, going back to what you were saying earlier with the guy that over the weekend that got the malware or the virus, you know, you go and restore to a time that he says he thinks it happened. You restore it, bring it up in AWS, and it's still got the malware on it. You go back and you can just kind of step through until you come find the time that when it didn't happen. You know, you don't have to restore or lose a whole... 24 hours of data or 48 hours of data by going to the last backup or whatever, you can actually go to that point in time and not lose any data. And the other thing I'm doing here as well is I actually have a second VM, which I just did a, uh, a touch to the, to the um, file system. I just added a blank file that says hello reInvent. So we're going to do the failover of that one as well. So let's see, that guy is located over here. Next. Let's make sure this is up to date. Okay, and next. All right. So while that's executing, let me give you a quick tour of what you're looking at over here. So as you can see, this is a dashboard. This dashboard over here is the Zerto Virtual Manager service. Now, if I was to log into the ZCA, so in other words, the process that's running within my VPC, it would look very similar to this. As a matter of fact, it would look almost identical. Now, that's by design. Ultimately, we don't want to care as you know, as a Zerto administrator, what the underlying architecture is outside of just knowing is it vSphere, is it AWS. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do a creation of a virtual protection group, add my VMs that need to be protected, and then I can do other administrative tasks that are related to replication, related to DR, re related to migrations, cloning, et cetera. So the way that I protect a VM is by going to this VPG window and clicking on this button that says new VPG. I'll just call it test VPG, very original, very original. And let's add a VM here. So I'll pick uh, uh, Red Hat 5, nah, uh, Red Hat 7. So I'll pick this guy here. Now, I, I can add additional VMs into this. So say that I had an additional uh, VM that was part of an application group. I could add this Red Hat 5.1 machine right here if I so desired. As a matter of fact, I will. Then I pick my site that I want to replicate to. And now what I'm starting to do is starting to set up the orchestration tasks that are going to take place as part of a failover. So what I'm doing is I'm setting up the journal history. I'm setting up the... Um, alert where Zerto will alert me if there is a breach of RPO. That usually happens if we have, say, network congestion. And uh, also a reminder, basically a, a, a nag in case that we haven't done a test fail over in a certain amount of time. Over here, we can exclude volumes from replication. So if you have multiple virtual disks and say some of those disks aren't required as part of your failover, say it's you know, temp data, we don't have to have temp data um, uh, actually replicated. We don't have to have the swap partition replicated. We can exclude that. And then over here, this is where it starts to get particularly interesting for the, for the AWS part. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick Zerto import for all volumes. So notice here it says fastest requires setup. That's where the pre-staging of those AWS drivers, those EC2 drivers are required. We have a utility called Zerto tools, which will do that for you. And our vision is that this will be all automated in the future. 
So for right now, um, you have to pre-stage those drivers. But if you don't want to pre-stage those drivers, or in the case of you know yes. separate <laughs> systems, um, you know separate separate departments, yeah. if they are not allowed to be pre-staged on those VMs, then we have Zerto import for data volumes, which uses a combination, a hybrid of the Z importer for our data volumes and the AWS API for the boot volume. So the AWS API will inject those drivers as, as required. But because I've already pre-staged those drivers, I'm just gonna pick Z import for all drivers. And now I'll pick my VPC, I'll pick my subnet, I'll pick my security group. So we talked a little bit earlier about going into separate availability zones. Well, we can choose which availability zones that these VMs are going to ultimately reside in. Just pick the subnet that's appropriate to that VPC. And then I can pick my VM size, or my, my instance size, excuse me. Um, and over here, you could see that I have a drop-down menu of a variety of different um, EC2 instances, you know, ranging from M5 instances, uh, R instances, uh, T1, T2. We also support T3 now um, with our latest iteration. I'm just not on that with, with this lab here. Yep. And that's it. So I click the done button, the VPG gets created, and we're off to the races. So let's do that. So while, while that's somewhere, one thing I wanted to point out, I, I think you, somebody was mentioning earlier. If you notice in there, so let's say you have a, a VMware cluster, right? So you have five hosts in a cluster. Well, you notice in there that that didn't ask you what host it was on, what, what ZRA it's on, anything like that. So in a cluster, you install the ZRA on, on every host in the cluster. Now, if that VM gets vMotioned between hosts in that cluster, Zerto knows that because it has a vCenter plugin and replication still stays in sync. If that host fails, HA, HA restarts your VM on another host. Zerto sees that replication stays in sync. You don't need to go in and manually reset all that up. Just wanted to make that, that point that, that it's, it's aware of what happens to that VM on the back end. You, don't, you know, if you move storage on the back end, if you, you know, migrate anything on the back end with its vCenter plugin, it will see that and adjust itself for that. I think we're about done. Yep, so just, just so that uh, we're keeping everyone informed as to what's happening here, I am now logging into my now failed over uh, Linux appliances in my VPC. Uh, so I'm just grabbing us the password right now. And the moment of truth here. There it is. So there, there's, our, there's our text file that I just uh, created just a moment ago, and now it's running as an EC2 instance. So what, what was a VM running in vSphere is now up in the cloud running as an EC2 instance. I can snapshot this, I can um, move it around, I can you know, basically do everything that I would do to a normal EC2 instance, created a AMI out of it. Oh, excuse, excuse me, AMI. Anyone following the AMI versus AMI slugfest between <laughs> AWS and Corey Quinn? AMI. Oh. <laughs> See. <That's funny. laughs> so going back to what you were saying earlier with, with, with the uh, malware, you restore that box in, a, in AWS, you verify the malware is gone, everything looks good, and you were saying while well, you fix your on-prem site. Well, at that point, if everything's good in AWS and the malware is gone, do you really need, I mean, if you don't need to fix that, then you just reset up the synchronization back, and then you can fail back. Does that make sense, what I'm talking about? I think you could wipe out that box. Wipe it out and then resync it back, and then you can fail it back from AWS back to your on-prem without, you know, minimal downtime at that point. With yeah. That, 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 yeah. That So, I mean, that's pretty much it from, from our perspective today. Um, as you can see here, we have a couple of new running instances that you know, didn't exist just a few <clears> minutes <throat> ago, um, but that now they are uh, you know, live up in a VPC. Uh, when I'm done with them, I just click on the, on the done button, the little stop icon that's in the ZCA. That'll terminate those instances. 
or alternatively, if I'm doing a live failover or if I'm doing a migration, I can hand it off completely to EC2 and Zerto no longer touches it. It's for all intents and purposes, a native instance that is running within your cloud. So that's pretty much all I wanted to cover today. Um, thank you very much for, for coming. I'm more than happy to answer additional questions. Um, so by all means, let's, uh, you know, if you've got some. Yeah, so good question. Um, so the S3 bucket is a secondary copy of your replicated data, right? So if the S3 bucket itself ends up having, say, you know, some sort of corruption event, you know, it, it could be anything, right? It could, you know, you you go into the S3 bucket and you, and you delete something. We're going to know about that. We're we're going to throw an error and we're going to basically have to do a resync. So we'll we'll. We'll know about it, but it's not like we're requiring you to do, say, region to region replication of a bucket. That being said, I have tested that um, in a very experimental capacity. Um, it works, uh, but as of right now, it's not a supported um, mechanism that we as Zerto will, will support. But know that it's one of those things that we're, we're continuing to explore and work on. Please. So let's say the source environment is VMware, or even if it's a Hyper-V, the disk format is VMDK or VHD. Yes. So do you do the disk conversion when replicate? We do. So when we are rep, so all that a VHD or a uh, VMDK happens to be is just a format to hold a block device. So we are reading the contents of that block device um, you know, at, at, the, at the bits and bytes level, right? So we're reading zeros and ones. So we actually don't need to do a conversion on the fly. That conversion is done when we actually do a failover. But long story short is yes, we handle all the, you know, the, the what I'll call the gross bits of a conversion. We'll, we will take what was originally a VMDK or a VHD and convert it into an EBS volume and then back if, if so desired. Okay, yeah, that was my follow-up question. Okay, got it. All right. Thank you. So when it comes to uh, the actual recovery, say, is it at all an effort to recover just one or two servers or all of them at once? Yeah, yeah we, we, we could do all at once. We could do one or two. Um, Kind of depends on what, what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Do you want to do a total site recovery all at once? Or do you want to do um, what I'll call a nested staged recovery? Um, if you want to do a nested staged recovery, um, then there are ways to do that, you know, either by going into the GUI or kicking it off via you know, our, one of our PowerShell commandlets. But yeah, I mean. So you need everything recovered. Everything back, or my, my mail server gets wiped. Mm -hmm. And so I need to jump into my mail server. So both of those are options. Yes. Is it, is it manual process or automated process? Well, so we won't do a failover for you. It's not like we'll do a, it's not like we have a heartbeat that is detecting that the, you know, the environment is healthy or not. And if it's not healthy, I'll do a failover. Personally, I think that's the better way because if you have, you know, say a temporary blip somewhere and you do an entire production failover, that could, you know, the, 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 the cure could be worse than the symptoms, right? Um, but that being said, once you kick off a disaster recovery event, which we define as like a, you know, a, a you know, that, that's something a human needs to, needs to sign off on, then yeah, you could either do a recovery of a single VPG or you could do a recovery of multiple VPGs or all of them. You had a question, sir? Yeah, uh, so is there, a, what's the roadmap for uh, VMware on AWS between, you know, VPK, VPK, and the, the practice prevention? Uh, yeah, so, so the, the question was regarding um, what is our roadmap for, for VMC, for VMware on AWS? And the answer is we are partners with VMware. 
Uh, we've looked into supporting VMC. It is currently not supported. However, we would like to support it. Um, I don't have a time frame for you right now, uh, but know that it, it is high on our on our visibility and you know just stay tuned. Yeah, so, so the question is regarding, uh, is re so, so the question basically is what's stopping us from, from using VMC today? And there are technical limitations. So VMC is not the same thing as vSphere on, on bare metal, right? There, there are certain things that VMC can't do today that you can in a, in a um, you know, bare metal environment. What you, what you really get is, um, you, you don't get root level access when you're in VMC. And that, that ultimately is the crux of our problem. Also, uh, VAIO is not yet a supported API on, uh, on VMC either. So once we have a way to, to do replication into VMC, absolutely, we, we want to support it. Um, but um, right now, it just it's not supported. So what we'd recommend instead is if you need to have a VMware environment um, in the cloud, um, you know there, there there are other options that I would recommend steering you to. Um, EC2 is certainly one of them, um, but we can we can certainly have a, a further discussion because that that can get complicated. Yeah. Okay, I am over time here, uh, so I will I will yield the floor. Thank you everyone for coming today. I very much appreciate it. Come see me. I'll give out my business cards and um, you know enjoy the rest of reInvent.